Support for this show comes from Lead Quizzes. Lead Quizzes helps you easily set up high converting quizzes to capture and qualify leads for your business. Visit leadquizzes.com slash podcast to get a 14-day free trial today. Well, the next step was we lost pretty much all our clients and I had no money and I was broke and depressed. And I told my partner, it was in August of 2014 and I was in Indianapolis at this conference that I was, it was like a fun conference I was supposed to go to with my friends and hang out and have a good time. And I was distracted, I was depressed. I didn't know what I was gonna do. We had lost all these clients and I just called him up. Actually, I Skyped him up because he was in Argentina at the Marriott in downtown Indianapolis. And I just said, listen, Federico, I'm done. From Lead Quizzes, it's Journey to Seven Figures, a show about entrepreneurs and the stories behind how they grew their business to seven figures and beyond. We cover the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the lessons they learned along the way. I'm Jeremy Ellens, and this is episode number two. On today's show, I interview Russ Perry. Russ started his entrepreneurial career by building a marketing agency. Now his agency struggled with productizing their services, creating a recurring business model, and many other common issues that plague agencies. Russ's business ultimately imploded, but led him to start Design Pickle providing unlimited graphic design support for just $370 a month. Russ learned from his failures and built a much better business model, resulting in $4.7 million in sales last year. If you're interested in how to build and grow an agency or build a recurring revenue model in your business, you're gonna love this episode. Let's jump in. All right, welcome back to Journey to Seven Figures. I'm very excited to introduce you today to our guest, Russ Berry. I'm really excited to talk to Russ today because before starting Lead Quizzes, I had an agency. And so running an agency is very difficult. And Russ is going to share his story on how he did that. But he's going to share how he really was able to niche that down and productize the service and solve a lot of the challenges that most agencies face. Russ last year did $4.65 million in his business. And so we're going to jump in. We're going to go through his history and his story of how he got there. So welcome, Russ. Hey, thank you. And I'd say... Agencies are beyond difficult. So anyone who actually can succeed with one, I really admire them. That's right. Me too. Cool. So Russ, your company now is called Design Pickle. And so you guys do unlimited graphic designs for 370 months. Anything else you want to add about that? No, I mean, it is a, at our core, we just call ourselves a graphic design company, but we've taken technology, we've taken a really narrow focus for it. And we really have a unique way in which we deliver this graphic design, which ends up becoming our competitive advantage. Okay, very cool. So we're going to get back to that. But I want to jump into your story of how you got there. So Russ, let's talk about when you were first starting out first starting your business, kind of walk me back, like how old were you? Like, why did you decide to get into it? Let's jump in. Well, like my first business ever was I tried to read to people for like a quarter of a book when I was like <laughs> five years old. That business did not succeed very well. But my real quote unquote foray into entrepreneur on uh, entrepreneurship was right after I graduated college. I was working for Apple and I loved the job. I mean, dream come true working for Apple. I've been an Apple fan a long time. But I was on the retail side, which is what most people see today in the stores. And once the glamour of actually working for Apple wore off, I was like, damn it, this job's kind of boring, actually. Like, I'm just a clerk at a store selling things. And I realized that my creativity, my problem solving, all of that stuff wasn't being utilized as well. And I uh, ended up getting really fortunate with a couple of freelance projects that were enough to allow me to quit. And my background is design. I studied graphic design and industrial design at Arizona State University and uh, ended up like, well, that's what I'm going to do. But I also had a business mind. I really liked the business side of things and the strategic side of things. So I quote unquote launched an agency, which ended up just being me and a couple freelancers and eventually a few people here in Arizona and ran that really as long as I possibly could. We had two versions of it. Let's back up for a second. So you started this agency with like some freelancers. Like what inspired you to like start doing freelance projects while you were still working at Apple at the same time? Yeah, well, the ultimate, the truthful answer is I had a daughter at a really young age. I was 22. I was a senior in college. And so after I graduated and I had this job, I was really trying to navigate time with her mom and seeing my daughter. 
Mm-hmm. And I was never married, so it was a bit of a juggle in terms of custody and all of this. And ultimately, like this straw that broke the camel's back was every time I would have time, it was this big fiasco of requesting time off. Like I had to file this report and make sure I had enough time and hours. And then if I requested the time off, but then something changed with my daughter's schedule, like it was really hard to change. And I just said, this sucks. I want to control my own time. And that was literally the reason why I thought I was smart enough to start my own business. I want to be able to not have to re- fill out these dumb request time off forms. And yeah. so that was it really. But yeah, I also loved helping people and I love the strategy. And I knew more than most when it came to branding and design because I had worked for Apple and I learned what it really meant to have emotion in your communications and care more about the feelings and the experience and the product. And that allowed me to kind of have a competitive advantage. So those are really like the core pieces of starting things out. Cool. So what were the first three steps you took after you committed? Like, I want to start doing this like freelance work. Well, the first step before I even committed was know how I was going to get paid. Okay. I didn't start the business and then try to find a client. I had a client lined up ready okay. for me. And in fact, I was doing both for a brief period of time. I was working at Apple during the day and freelancing at nighttime. So that freelancing just became impossible to really do because I only could work at night after I was done working during the day. And that's when I took the leap to full-time. Was, but I had the money lined up. It wasn't a lot. There was only about 90 days worth of runway. But that was enough for me to take the leap. And after that, it was just really incrementally always just knocking down that next milestone, whether it was getting a few more clients, formally creating a business entity, starting some marketing, hiring people, and just was a little bit, little bit, little bit, quite some time. So how did you first knock the first ones down? Because if your story is anything like mine, when we started Yasmo, our, our agency, like we would pretty much take anything we could oh, get. Like, <laughs> Well, I had a whale of a first client. It was a buddy I went to college with, and he ended up getting a marketing job at a corporate position with a division of LG, like the electronics manufacturer. Although I didn't work in that cool division, I worked in the very boring division of countertops and yeah. solid surfaces. <laughs> so, but it was just tons of design, tons of production. We were close friends. I mean, we were doing a ton of work right out of the gates. So whether that's luck or great networking or just validation that, hey, a higher education could pay off <laughs> even today, then, then that's all that it was. And from there, that work and that notoriety, hey, these guys worked with LG, that was a strong point in terms of sales to find other local clients. Cool. And it was all boots on the ground networking. I mean, asking, talking, telling, and... Thankfully, during the time, I mean, really, the internet was exploding, mobiles coming onto the scene. There's tons of stuff with social, like it's just really growing fast. So people needed help. And it didn't take a lot of work to get into a conversation where someone was just like, oh, hey, I need help with my website or hey, I need help with my brand. It sucks. I need to do this. But that was all one to one sales. And it was like really, really time consuming. And our deal sizes were really big relative to our volume of clients. So as you know, now, like you lose one client, it's not like the end of the world. But if you lost one client as an agency, when you only have 10, man, that could be like... It's a big deal. Yeah, that could be like no Christmas for you. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So when you started out, were you doing all of like the sales and the production yourself? Or were you outsourcing this to people like through Upwork or something? So the design with my first agency, the first iteration of it, we had our yep. whole team here in Arizona. So okay. everyone was hired here. We had an office down on Mill Avenue in the Brickyard. Like we were really committed to that model, mm-hmm. but it didn't work. Like we couldn't scale. We were the generalist agency. So I attempted what ended up becoming the decision that gave me the confidence for our current business model. But I found a partner in Argentina really randomly, to be honest. A subcontractor that we had had was from Mexico City. She had connections in South America. And I met this guy from Argentina. And he's like, dude, I got this creative team down here. It's less than your team there. Why don't you run the clients? I'll do the design. I'll manage the designers. And I was like, this sounds awesome. Because 
I did a really bad job of managing people when I had my first agency. So that ended up becoming on paper, a good plan. But again, this lack of niching, this lack of a specific focus killed us and crushed us because every time either we got a new project, it was kind of a one-off or every time there was a challenge or a problem in a current project, it was so unique that there was no way to improve our process or figure out a better way to deliver whatever it was we were selling. Cool. So what originally was like this, like, hey, work with this cheaper team in Argentina and you can make more money because it's going to cost less. There was just so many errors and mistakes and written off revenue that we ended up closing that too, just because it was going to work. Okay. So you're making a lot of mistakes that most agencies made. I've made these mistakes. <laughs> so when you talk about niching down, are you talking about productizing your service? Or are you just doing branding and design at the time? Or what are you doing? You know, at the time, I could not care less about, I would have been happy with any niche. Like okay. going after, you know, Arizona, like farmers or something like it would have been fine for me, but this was a partnership collision that I was never able to get through. And we got super close to niching and, and we started to, to implement and sell HubSpot, which I loved. And I love the tool, We're actually a client of them now, again, after all these years. And the problem was we misestimated, underestimated the amount of technical implementation that was required to really get these things dialed in. So this, remember, this was like 2012, 2013, going into 2014. So these tools were, were there, but even in two or three years, they weren't as common as they were now. So I sold the shit out of it. I sold like half a million dollars of HubSpot implementation, all this mm. stuff that we just couldn't deliver. And that was like, that was the kiss of death for us. So we like eventually did niche. We just didn't understand the true way to do what we were selling. Okay. <laughs> and we had to close shop. Okay. So that was a problem. Like when you were selling, like you were actually getting sales, was that still like hustle and referral? Or did you start to generate some predictable sources of leads? Dude, always hustle and referral. I mean, I was terrible at it because we didn't have a niche. So we weren't experts at anything. We weren't doing great with our current clients, so no one was referring us. We had a really super general website, so it was an impossible digital funnel to have. Even my coworkers and friends, and my, even my mom never really knew what I did, so no one could just tell us, hey, you got to go work with these guys. So it ended up just becoming how good could Russ Perry sell, period. Sure. And, and I so, eventually didn't want to do that anymore. And it sounds like you didn't have a lot of recurring revenue either. Zero. Okay. <laughs> I have recurring negative revenue if that counts. Like, yeah. <laughs> okay. So that was a problem productizing as far as saying like, all right, we're going to do something really specific. Like we're going to help you set up a blog with HubSpot and make your content marketing work really well. That was our attempt. That was our yeah. attempt. But yeah. We couldn't pull it off. Okay. So those things weren't working well. So it sounds like you got some like pain moments. You started losing some clients, so they weren't referring you. So what was the next step in that? What happened? Well, the next step was we lost pretty much all our clients and I had no money and I was broke and depressed. And I told my partner, it was in August of 2014 and I was in Indianapolis at this conference that I was, it was like a fun conference. I was supposed to go to with my friends and hang out and have a good time. And I was distracted. I was depressed. I didn't know what I was going to do. We lost all these clients and I just called him up. Actually, I Skyped him up because he was in Argentina at the Marriott in downtown Indianapolis. And I just said, listen, Federico, I'm done. And he knew the writing was on the wall. So that was like August 14th. And by September 1st, everything was closed and divided. And we had just, and there were zero. I, I was technically unemployed. That was crazy scary. And I, then I realized, well, shit, I got to figure out something else really fast because I don't have any money right now. Yeah. Okay. So that was like a really hard moment for you. How did you get through that? Or how did you overcome that when you decided you wanted to move on? Well, it was beyond a hard moment. It was a terrifying moment. And, and a moment too, in which my identity was stripped away from me. So aside from just not having money, I didn't have my identity anymore. Mm -hmm. I was the guy that would go to the family event or the party or the kid's birthday or whatever. And it was like, Oh, Russ, how's business? Blah, blah, blah. And those questions were still coming, but to be completely honest, I just say, well, like I actually lied at the time. Like I'd be like, oh, it's all right. So, you know, business is tough. Oh, just kind of like a super generic answer. And I was in entrepreneurial groups at the time and all this stuff, accelerators. So it was just like, 
it was hard to, to lose all of that. But also at the same time, it was very therapeutic because I finally had just a completely clean slate. Mm-hmm. No clients, no partner, no employees. And so the first 30 to 60 days was just like, let's get a Band-Aid on this cash flow situation. And I got a couple consulting deals you know, through friends and friends and, and at least got my base covered through that. So I had some breathing room. And once that was established, then I said, well, look, I don't have a clue on what I'm going to do. Maybe I could hire somebody, a coach or somebody to help me out. And that's what I did. I invested in several coaches and consultants and went to events. I went to this like all women's event. It was me and one other guy and like 25 women talking about all sorts of stuff. But that introspection and that, that willingness to bring in outside perspective I think really primed my mind to eventually put together what became Design Pickle, which ended up happening around December 2014. So two to three months after everything fell apart. Okay. So two to three months after you started getting ideas for Design Pickle, which was at the time, was it still unlimited design for a flat rate per month? Well, the design pickle aha moment wasn't out of nothing, the ether. It was because I had created this model with my consulting clients. Mm -hmm. So you see, when I came into the consulting gig as an ex-agency creative guy, like you're pretty good at everything. So you could you could do a logo, you could do a business card, you could do a brand strategy. So my consulting engagements were this again, just like a miniaturized versions of my disorganized agency. And for the production design, I knew I hadn't been in the driver's seat of the design for a while. I always had designers. So I just found a couple people online to manage that for me. And then I just had this aha moment. I was like, well, I wonder if I could just put my consulting clients on a ticketing system just for this one piece of the, the service. So, you know, the marketing guy at, at this company needs a business card. He just emails this, the project manager and freelance designer get it and they can just do it. I review it, make sure it's okay. And then I send it over. So that happened and started happening. And I ended up having all my clients using this thing. And that was like super easy. And it actually, they were really happy about it. And then all the brand strategy or WordPress theming or whatever else I was doing, it was like such a hassle. And I was the one doing it. And then I read a book, Seven Day Startup by Dan Norris. And he's the the co-founder for WP Curve, which was a WordPress update site that had a subscription revenue model around it. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, oh my gosh, I, I'm doing this. I'm not selling it the same way they're selling it, but I'm implementing this in a very similar way. I should maybe do this. And yeah, so I, I branded it and relaunched it or launched it formally in January, 2015. And from that moment we did stick. And I knew in my mind, like I want subscription revenue. I want subscription revenue. I want subscription revenue. And I remember actually this same time, my grandmother on my mom's side had passed away and I had flown to Colorado, Denver. And if you've ever been to Denver, it's like a suburban sprawl. You're just driving all the time. So I was listening to the Y Combinator podcast and the series they did at like Harvard, I think, or not Harvard, at Stanford. And they were just like subscription revenue, subscription revenue, subscription revenue. So that's what I just knew. That's what it was. I was like, well, I'm going to try to sell design in a subscription revenue model. (laughs) And that was the commitment. (laughs) Awesome. That's cool. So that's like a big thing that you overcame with the agency. Like we ran into that ourselves, like where, you know, you sell a big project, but then like next month, if that is completed, you got to start selling again. Or like, it's super hard to pay for like overhead expenses, employees, like, predict like the growth of your company if you don't have that recurring revenue. So you figure that out with Design Pickle. Let's say you productize it down. So this reminds me of like the E-Myth. So you, you brought up the seven day startup, but what comes to my mind is the E-Myth where they talk about this agency and they decide to like focus really in on just logo designs and they're going to make a product around it. So you get really, really good I mean, at just no, doing logos. It's, it's built to sell. Built to sell is that. Built book. to sell. Yeah. Yeah. The E-Myth is Michael Gerber with the different, yeah. but yeah, no, dude. And I read built to sell after that, after that, that allegory. I read it at like, I think halfway through 2015. And I just was like, yes, like, <laughs> this is what this guy did. I did it after. Yeah. <laughs> so amazing. So you got that down. Explain the pricing because you also made a compelling offer with this. This wasn't something that was like a normal thing in the industry, right? Well, and that was the, the other piece. Yeah. So there was a subscription revenue component to it. 
And then there was what we did with that, like what we gave you. And we just said, unlimited. Like we just said, you can request, you know, I've not any potential, like design you can think of as motion graphics or after effects or logo or whatever. But we said, okay, here's a bucket of design things we can do. Like we call it production design. Like pretty comprehensive for what 80% of a business is going to need after their website and their brand is done. We're going to just say, in this bucket, which is a big bucket, you can dip in and get as much as you can get out of us for this flat rate. And everyone thought I was nuts. And to this day, everyone thinks of like, well, how do you not get taken advantage of? And the irony was, was like, you only need so much in a month, really, if you're a normal business. Now, we have our edge case studies of guys who really use it a ton. And, and there's you know, they run into it a limitation eventually just because their designer can only design so fast. But it just was like, can we just make it super easy for people to buy design? Because prior to that, buying design is the biggest hassle ever. Like you got to find a guy, then you got to meet a guy, then you got to talk about a project and then they got to give you a proposal and then you get a concept and then you got to wait for revisions and you get two revisions and you got to pay more. And it was just like, oh my gosh, this is a headache. And I know because I did that. I was yeah. that guy. <laughs> we'll get back to the show in a minute, but first a quick thanks to our sponsor, Lead Quizzes. If you want to grow your business to seven figures and beyond, you must learn how to generate leads predictably. When I first started my business, lead generation felt like riding a roller coaster. I would have huge sales months and then months with nothing. This happened because I relied solely on referrals and networking to grow my business. Predicting growth and investing in the future were frightening because I didn't have control over my lead generation. That was before we created lead quizzes. Now I predictably generate leads in my sleep and have stopped worrying about where the next sale will come from. Top marketers like Neil Patel and Lewis House have used lead quizzes to increase their lead capture by up to 500%. Think about it. Quizzes are fun, engaging, and you can offer personalized feedback in exchange for your quiz takers' contact information. Lead quizzes is a software that allows you to set up high converting quizzes quickly without having to hire an expensive programmer. In fact, our users have generated over 3 million leads for their businesses. Take control of your lead generation today and start your 14-day free trial by going to leadquizzes.com slash podcast. Okay, so you figured out just a lot better business model. So I think it's interesting. I have a mentor who's uh, he's on the board of this $100 million investment company. And one of the things interesting that he said about like raising money is like, I think between now and if you like raise money, you're going to work exactly the same amount of you know, hours. You're going to work just as hard as you would like later. So I think that's something interesting about the agency. I'm sure you were working just as hard in the agency as you were with Design Pickle. You just found a better business model. And I think of honestly, like the richest people in this world, they have turned things into commodities, like the oil guy, the electric guy, the Cox cable guy, the car dealership guy, like they create a business model that can have massive flow and mass scale of a service or a product, you know, windows and Bill Gates, mm -hmm. things like that. And so that was like, like, could we make design like a commodity? Not in the, not in the way where most designers get radically offended by us. We're like, we're, you're commoditizing our industry and devaluing the universe, the fabric design of the universe. It's like, no, like, can we make it? like still valuable, there's like a value to it, but can we make it as easy as buying gas or as easy as buying, you know, like, well, like buying electricity is not easy. It's actually a pain in the ass. But you know, like the flow of it is super simple. There's not yeah. a ton of resistance. And that was always the kind of philosophy around it. Yeah, they don't know. The ticketing system is a brilliant system compared to how it normally is working with an agency. And maybe you don't hear back right away and all kinds of back and forth and crazy stuff like that. So very cool that you achieved some of these things that I'm sure you learned from your agency. So how did you get your first like 100 or, you know, 1000 customers? Like, was it still hustle and referral? Or did you start finding predictable sources of leads? The first 100 and first 1000 are two very different strategies. So the first 100 came with, with spamming every single person I knew in my every email I could get my hands on. So, and actually I got blocked by Gmail the first month out of the gates because I was just BCCing everybody. There you go. <laughs> and I, didn't even, I didn't even sign up for like MailChimp free or anything. I was just brute forcing it. And then 
I would say successfully did a guest blogging strategy. It wasn't as good as I think I could have done nowadays, but I just teed up people to say, hey, can I write for you and talk about this? And then like whatever it was, so his lead quizzes would be like, hey, I'm going to talk about how design is important for customer surveys or whatever. Like I just spun it to whatever the blog was. Mm -hmm. then, then the first big win for us was doing a trade show. So we did the Infusion Soft Conference. We got a lot of buzz, a lot of awareness there. We made some deals, closed some deals. And then at that point, we were able to really afford paid advertising. And from 100 beyond was a combination of paid acquisition through Facebook and, and some Google. And then some events, we did a lot of events last year, but they all weren't good. So I would say, you know, for us this year, it's all digital paid acquisition is how we're getting our clients. Okay. So a lot of like hustle for the first hundred clients. And then afterwards you turn to Facebook and Google. So what was the strategy there? Cause you guys charge 370 a month. And I think that price has increased a little bit as you guys have started, but how did you first start getting those customers after a hundred? Yeah. And for the host, the design pickle historians who are actually listening to this podcast, a bit of a correction, we launched at 195 a month and then we increased it to 370 a month. So I increased it relatively quick when like basically even my clients were saying you need to charge more. Yeah. Us. Like, so, but that's also one thing too, when you first start, like sometimes we did it with e quizzes, we, we charged less, we made a really good deal because you got to get people in and you got to start getting case studies and feedback and yeah, all your yeah. process in. So I like testing the system and all that kind yeah. of stuff. Well, we went to the point in the paid acquisition for us, we needed enough money to be able to like lose money and not be like losing the money we're trying to use to pay ourselves. Mm -hmm. So that's why we had to wait a while. And then what's kind of nice about a product that's priced in, I think over a hundred dollars and it's paid in full, like up front, like we close somebody, we, that transaction comes in right away. Simply put is we can afford to buy clients it's really hard to buy a client if your first month's revenue is seven dollars or nothing because you you know like you just can't roi anything on it yeah and that's a good point too because i don't know what you did with your agency but we used to do this like you know 50 percent up front or 50 percent at the end when if you can switch to collecting the money up front on some kind of retainer service it's such a better model it's insanely better and I would never do an agency ever again, but if I did, I'd have everyone pay through Stripe with a credit card and like that's the only way they get paid. There's no way I would do billing and invoicing. Actually, anecdotally, we're trying to buy a building right now and the underwriter for the loans like, "Well, let me see your accounts payable." I'm don't like, "Well, I don't, I don't have one." <laughs> He's like, "What do you mean?" I was like, "Well, here are 2000 emails and 2000 credit cards. I don't actually show them the credit card numbers. I don't even have access to that in the report, but like here's 2000 emails and I have all their credit cards and I just build them every month. It's like, what? Like, it's just so like, they don't understand. I've had to go around like email, like three different rounds of emails trying to explain this to these. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So you're collecting money up front, which means you're able to acquire customers. So you're running ads on like Facebook or Google. And then what are you sending them to Right to a sign up page and that's working or what do you do? So we've tried everything. We've tried being super cutesy, clever with webinars, evergreen webinars, live webinars, demos, this and that. The number one thing that sells is sending them to a, our homepage or sending them to a pricing page. It says, do you, we sell graphic design. Do you need graphic design? If so, buy here. All that other stuff, like opting into a, a lead funnel or whatever, like it just elongates the sales cycle because what we're selling is really different than like, say what you're selling. Like I'm selling a commodity of a business that pretty much everyone understands. They may understand it differently. You're trying to sell a new way to market and aggregate data and collect data that I would understand easily. But let's say the doctor's office that may want it, like you got to explain it a little more or show them the why this is valuable because they've never done that before. So I'm not saying my way works better than others. It's just because I'm selling a simple thing mm -hmm. that time and time again, sending traffic to a sales page, direct response to ads just works the best. Okay. Awesome. And then so for you going from a thousand customers to scaling up to like you said, $4.65 million in a year, is that just continually, you know, driving Facebook and Google and then making sure you're retaining those customers? Continuing to increase our ads and doing a good job with our clients. Awesome. A couple of things I'm interested in here. So like 
any recurring business, whether it's software or even as an agency, like retention is a huge thing. So what are you doing to really focus on your retention? Well, oddly enough, our retention is made or broken in the first seven days of our client experience because if a client has a challenge communicating or getting their first design back correctly, then they will churn out and cancel them on a refund. If we can deliver that first experience in a solid way, then the next 10 things can have problems and they'll still stay with us Mm. because they know what's possible and they will stick with it. So it's a very different type of scenario for us. And also like we have a very just frustrating, but also a churn problem of happy clients that we just have no way we can solve. It's like, Russ, signed up for your service. Use it for three months. I love it. I got my project done. We're moving on. Thank you so much. (laughs) And you're just like, ah, what can we do? Nothing. You guys were great. I love you guys. Well, how about this? No, yeah. I don't need it. I just don't need it. <laughs> yeah, so I think the lesson to take from that is like for your retention, you found it's really focusing on the customer experience and having a, enough people that went through it, you can see the data that if they make it through the first seven days, they're going to stick on. Yeah, and they don't even need to finish their first project in that time. They just need to have a, a warm experience. They need to feel like they're being listened to. That first mock-up needs to be right on or close to it. And and if we can do that, we're in good shape. And For a service business, this is pretty high. Or for a SaaS business, this would be considered high. But we are continually at 11 or 12% churn rate. So to us, that's solid. Like, we're really happy. I hope to get to single digits one year, but there's just unavoidable churn of super happy clients that just bring that up a couple of points. Sure. Okay. Awesome. One of the other things that you've done that's made this like model work for you is outsourcing. Do you want to talk through like that strategy, what you've done to make that work? Yeah, so it's outsourcing in the very literal sense that our design teams in the Philippines, but I call it like full-time outsourcing and that we treat these team members like our team and they're paid like a full-time team member. So yeah. we're not just trying to compile a bunch of random people and throwing up design jobs. Hey, who wants it? We have trainings, we have systems, we have culture, we have managers, we have promotions, we have benefits, we have all of this, but our core team is located in a part of the world where economically we can pay them extremely well, like more than three times the average salary that they would normally get. And economically for a business located in the United States, it's still a lower cost of labor than hire 100 US designers who have a much higher cost of living and require a much higher salary to maintain. And what about like the appreciation and loyalty of like those kinds of people? You know, I'll piss some people off, but I say this as one of the people who used to be in this bucket, U.S. and Western designers, a lot of them are insanely egotistical. They think design is a elite type of experience that you can only get access to if you can afford to pay enough money. And even some guys, primarily dudes to rattle off on our Facebook ads, that have a level of racism involved that if you aren't working with a U.S. designer, that you're somehow destroying America, And which is ironic because these same guys, I'm sure, use Apple computers, which are made in China, and I'm sure they use Uber, which their first app was programmed in South America. So, like, it's uh, stupid. But for the design team that we have in the Philippines, we're creating such a high quality of life for them. They are so appreciative and they're happy And they're just pumped up. And like, I wish I could have thought of the business model to hire U.S. designers and pay them $120,000 a year because I'm sure I'd have the same irrational loyalty to some degree. I just haven't thought of that yet. So I have been the business model that I can do the best of. But then for our U.S. team, because we're, I think, approaching our 16th hire here, we're doing the same thing. We have customer service positions that we pay higher than average. We have college kids right out of the gates making full-time wages with benefits. So we want to increase the quality of life with our U.S. team and our Filipino team and create that loyalty across the board. Yeah, I think that's really smart. And the other thing that you mentioned here that I think you did a good job with is like hiring them full-time. Like if anyone's ever hired, you know, virtual people and you put them on for 10 hours a week or a project at a time, my experience has always been like you can encounter a lot of flakiness because they're always looking for that next job or looking for something else, which is understandable. But 
you know, you figured out if you put them on full time and you pay them competitively, it's usually going to be a good recipe. Absolutely. Cool. So let's see, what's the next milestone for you guys? You had 4.5 last year. Like what are your goals or aspirations next? Up to eight figure year for us. That's where we're headed. We want to hit eight figures and we're going to do whatever we can to nail that profitably, obviously. And then, you know, for me, it's a lot of focus on my personal brands. I mentioned earlier in pre notes, I'm launching a book in a couple of weeks. And so, you know, just kind of stepping into a CEO role where my team can run Design Pickle, I can support them creatively and strategically, and then I can be focused on some, some other projects as well. Okay. So it sounds like more leadership and getting like the teammates to help run the business and grow the yeah, business. Yeah, you know, like just really developing them and looking at my role, not as an operator, but my role as a coach and a leader for my team to help bring them up. Sure, okay. A couple quick questions before we wrap up here. What was the one thing you did that had the biggest impact on your growth? Paid advertising. Okay. Um, <laughs> and now. honestly, and I'll say this in all seriousness, if you, the listener, are not doing paid advertising, you do not have enough confidence in your product or service. So you need to fix that somehow. Yeah. Or maybe like there's not enough profits in your business and you got to be able to build that in for the advertisement. Yeah, exactly. Kind of your prices. Okay. Awesome. And then Russ, last question. Like if you could go back in time and start over, what would you tell yourself? <laughs> Man, like how far back in time? <laughs> <laughs> maybe to the beginning of even just design pickle. Okay. I would come back to pricing again and I would say charge more, always charge more. I think we have this sort of mindset of, oh, well, I want to, you know, I don't know. I don't know the value. Like, look, if you're confident in your idea, whatever price you're thinking of, you should double it because there's a million people out there who are willing to pay that amount. And whatever that amount is times a million is probably a pretty good business. Okay. Awesome. All right. Well, Russ, like where can people find you besides designpickle.com to check out your services? Yeah, so I'm in a competition. My wife doesn't know this to beat her in Instagram followers. So if you can please follow me on Instagram, it's just Instagram.com slash Russ Perry. I really would appreciate that. I promise I won't spam you or show <laughs> photos of like baby strollers or something. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, if you're interested, we won't have time to go into today, but I'm launching a book and we're giving away a free copy. It's called the soberentrepreneur.com. If you don't know how to spell entrepreneur and just give it a shot, Google will fix it. <laughs> and uh, that's a very personal story of my entrepreneurial journey, also around my personal struggle and as well as overcoming alcoholism. So that's a pretty big topic. And I talk all about it. And that book's coming out in just a couple of weeks here. Awesome. Well, Russ, like, thanks so much for coming on and sharing your story to hit uh, seven figures. It was really helpful. I think we unpacked a lot of lessons that'll save people a bunch of time. I know it would have saved me if I had heard this before when I started my agency. <laughs> me too. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Jimmy. All right. Thanks, Russ. Thanks again for listening to our show this week. If you want to find out more about Russ Perry and the lessons he shared today or read our show notes, visit leadquizzes.com slash two. If you'd like to start generating more leads for your business and get a 14-day free trial to Lead Quizzes, go to leadquizzes.com slash podcast. Please also subscribe to our show on Apple or however you get your podcasts. I'm Jeremy Ellens, and you've been listening to Journey to Seven Figures. <laughs>